सहनावतु सहना भुनाक्तु सहवीरवाहाय तेजस्वी नीतमस्तु मा विद्विषावहाय शांति 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 नमस्ते so at the sacrifice vajasravas the son of one whose reputation is based on giving food he's trying to outdo his father maybe or he certainly is uh, striving for a result to go to the heavenly planets and as a result he's cutting a few corners in his sacrifice giving away these old cows that are good for anything and are just going to be a burden on the brahmins that receive them so because of this offense he's certainly going to get a lower birth than he's expecting his son who is just kumara he's not even pubescent he's still a boy but he sees this clearly and he gets faith he gets inspired and then he says sahova chapitaram tata kasmai mangdasya siti dvitiyang tritiyang tang hova chamritya vetva tadamiti he said to his father father to whom will you give me he said this a second and a third time then his father replied unto death i will give you well we've all had days like this <laughs> especially bringing up small children and we're trying to do something you know that we think is serious and then out of the mouth of babes comes the truth that we're not quite ready to face and what the truth is in this case is that father you're messing up this sacrifice and you're not going to get the result that you think you are because you're giving away these low class animals and you know you should be giving away first class cows huh with calves giving milk like that so i tell you what father to correct the imbalance to correct the deficiency in your sacrifice you give me away too I mean you're giving everything else away right then am I not one of your possessions as your son can you not do what you wish with me by the way the word that's used here dadamiti dasya siti see he says he's not only saying to whom are you going to give me but he's he's ready to become a slave dasya see dasya si ti uh, has the implication that to whoever he is given he will be a slave and uh, iti iti of course means thus it's a way of affirming what was just said and similarly the father replies mrtya vetva dadam iti uh -huh. thus i shall give you to death Oof. well he probably you know <laughs> overstated it a little bit um but you know it, we see this or well, we hear this in conversations sometimes people will be arguing and one of them will say oh god to hell you know they don't really mean it literally they just mean like get out of my face you know <laughs> quit bugging me i guess you have to go up around new york <laughs> to see things like that you know it's like the town i grew up in was a mafia uh safe town all the dons and their families lived there and there was no crime zero crime people had a certain way of dealing with one another that we would probably consider very rough you know hey how you doing 
All right, boss, how are you? Ah, eh, get lost, you know? <laughs> no, really, I, it's like I grew up on the set of The Sopranos in New Jersey, you know? And uh, everything I saw going on around me was of that same tone. So, it, you know, I can understand if he's having a bad day, maybe he's sick, you know, or he's trying to get through this sacrifice, which is a big deal, a lot of complications, and the gifts are finally being led away to be given to the Brahmins, and this kid pipes up, hey, Dad, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> you're giving away everything. You might as well give me away, too. Who are you going to give me to? You know, the kid has got some moxie, you know. He's got some gumption. He's got an attitude, too. <laughs> so it's understood, understandable if the father gets a little upset. But, I mean, really, this is over the top. I give you to death. Now, try to understand the situation. This is not in the West in Kali Yuga. This is in India or someplace like India under Vedic culture a long time ago when people in general, and especially Brahmins, and especially in the midst of a sacrifice, were expected to speak the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help me God, you know, literally. So for him to say this, like at the climax of this great sacrifice was like a big deal because the set and setting, the context, implies that he really literally meant it. I will give you to death. So then the boy goes off. I mean, this is natural, right? And he's contemplating, hmm, what just happens? And how should I respond to it? And he says to himself, Bahuna me ti pratamo, Bahuna me me madhyamaha, King Svidyamasya kartavyang, Yan mayadya karishyati. Among many, I rank as belonging to the highest. Among many, I rank as belonging to the middling. What purpose of death can there be that my father will get achieved today? through me. Now, this is intelligence. See, this is what shows that this is no ordinary boy. Uh, you know, you, you could uh, ascribe his comments to his father as being cheeky and maybe rebellious and sarcastic and all like that. But actually, there was something real behind it. And now this is coming out in more detail. What is the purpose of death in arranging this? What does he hope to accomplish through my father cursing me to die? So in other words, he is well aware that death is not an impersonal or mechanical phenomenon, that there's intelligence involved, that death is not arbitrary, that death is a lawful thing uh, having to do with the law of karma and the uh, attribute of Ishwaratam, the controller, being the controller, being the nature of God. And so, okay, if I am to die, God has some reason for this. This is not arbitrary. It's not accidental. Huh? It's not just happening by coincidence. There is no coincidence. <laughs> Everything is the will of God. But this is intelligent. This means that we're, we're not dealing here with an ordinary boy, an ordinary stupid kid. No. First of all, he is the son of a Brahmana. And in those days, that meant years of strict training for example, in the memorization of scriptures. I've seen it. When I was in India, our organization at that time had a gurukula, a children's school, and they brought in traditional brahmanas to teach them. And they were teaching them by rote. 
Uh, they would write something on the blackboard and then point at it and chant it, and they were expected to repeat it until they could repeat it perfectly. And then they were supposed to memorize it so that they could repeat it by heart. And they did. And we will see this talent on display in later on in the dealings between Nachiketa and death. So now death has been invoked by the father at a great sacrifice in front of the fire. Huh? In other words, no one is expected uh, to speak a lie before the fire. And in olden days, when there was no court system or judges available, I mean, sometimes the king would act as a judge. But out in the villages, in the middle of nowhere, you know, where are you going to find a judge? So instead, they would have the sacred fire be the judge. Everyone would gather, and both sides would present their case before the fire. And by the result or by the reaction, by the response uh, given by the fire, they would determine the merits of the case. So no one was expected to speak a lie before the fire. The fire is God. The fire is the supreme, the ultimate truth. Huh? Remember, we talked last time about how the sun diminishes everyone's span of life day by day. And that's why it's known as an inauspicious planet in Vedic astrology. <clears throat> well, death, Mrityu, Yama, being the son of the sun, means the result of the sun. And in the same way, Nachiketa, being the son of the great sacrificer, even though he may have, you know, a short temper, maybe he's having a bad day, who knows, but still, the words were spoken before the sacred fire, so they have to be true. Uh, this reminds me in Mahabharata, the five Pandavas had a vow that whatever their mother spoke, whatever words came from her mouth, they would literally be willing to sacrifice their lives to prove those words true. And it got them into trouble more than once. Uh, one day, while they were incognito, living in the forest as brahmanas, uh, they went begging. And uh, part of the begging, they wound up at the Swayambara in a king's palace. And uh, so the Swayambara is how the princesses would choose their husband. So this particular Swayambara was an archery contest. And of course, Arjuna won <laughs> effortlessly. And so he got the girl, and they bring her home to introduce to their mother. And Dropadi is cooking facing away from them. And they say, oh, mother, look what we got uh, on our begging. And uh, without turning around, without seeing, she says, well, whatever it is, be sure and share it equally with your brothers. Oops. You know, I could hear a pin drop. And she turns around and looks and sees the girl, and she's like, oh, my God, what did I just say? So after consulting with Vyasadeva and other senior people, all five brothers married Draupadi because that is simply the price that the sons were willing to pay to ensure the absolute truth and truthfulness of their mother. And we'll see something similar going on here. Aung Tatsa. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya. <laughs>